So good morning. Um, just wanted to th- thank the church uh, for the, the generous Christmas gift that, uh, that we received. Uh, you guys are just uh, over and abundantly uh, generous and, and kind, and just really appreciate that. Um, this morning, you know, there are certain uh, seasons and events uh, in our lives that, uh, that lend themselves to kind of personal reflection and, and even what some people call course life course correction, where, where we're going in one way and, and sometimes the Lord uses certain, certain times and events in our life to, to change that direction. Well, every year, many of us, in fact, most of us probably make some well-meaning uh, but fruitless um, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, end of the year promises and, and these resolutions that we're going to do during the next year. And, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of times we don't fulfill those. Uh, but we do that because there's something inside of us uh, that, that beckons us to be and to do more uh, than what we have in the past. To, we long to, to be more and to do more. And, and I think that, that that's something that in us that's in us is, is God-ordained. Uh, in fact, that's kind of the point uh, of my message this morning. And, and you'll see in your sermon outline at the very top, there's what I'm calling my, the point of the message. And that is that God has an eternal purpose and plan, and He has graciously and sovereignly chosen to include us in its implementation. Uh, so um, as I was preparing, as Tim asked me to, uh, to uh, uh, lead in teaching this morning, I was, I was thinking, well, what, you know, what should I do? And, and he didn't give me any particular guidelines. He didn't say, oh, you have to go back to Ephesians or whatever. And I thought, well, you know, I, that's where I've been reading as I've been going back and reading through Ephesians as we've been studying through that. And as I was reading in chapter 3, which is where we would start uh, again as he picks back up in the series and reading those first 13 verses, you know, something kind of jumped out at me. And, and, and so I'm going to use Ephesians uh, Three verses one through thirteen as kind of a launching point, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of give just a brief, um, I guess you'd call it a, a character study of the Apostle Paul, and and what jumped out at me in the in the verses those first thirteen verses um, was the statement that you know God has this purpose that He has a plan this eternal purpose that He's working out, and I think that that's a great message for us. Uh, starting, fixing to start the new year. And so that's what we're going to be uh, doing. So um, I'd like to read through those verses again uh, with you. If you'd turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul writes, For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might, be, might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is for your glory. Again, so kind of thinking about the Apostle Paul and and what he writes here, and and some things jumped out at me uh, in that, some, some, I guess, verbs in there. And those verbs kind of call to mind the fact that the Apostle Paul recognized God's eternal purpose and plan in his call upon his life. In fact, if you look at chapter 1, verse 1 of Ephesians, Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Christ, by the will of God. And you find that over and over again throughout his epistles, how he acknowledges that, that he hasn't chosen this path for his life, that he didn't um, say, well, this is going to be my career path. I'm going to be an apostle to the Gentiles, but that it was God's will and God's purpose in his life. And, and that purpose was part of God's eternal plan, eternal purpose and plan. 
You see that in verse 2 of chapter 3, where he talks about the stewardship of God's grace had been given to him. Okay, there's one of those verbs. In verse 3, he says that the mystery has been made known to him through the revelation from God. And in verse 7, uh, he says he's been made a minister of the gospel. Not that I made myself a minister, but I've been made a minister of the gospel as a gift of God's grace, which have been given to him for the working, through the working of God's power. Again, this wasn't part of Paul's planned career path. Uh, this was given and placed upon him by God. And in verse 8, again, he says that the gift of God's grace to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable reach, riches of Christ had been given to him. So you see these references of how Paul saw that God has a plan and he has included him in that plan, that he set him apart uh, for his purposes. So my mind goes to the question, well, well why did God uh, choose Paul? You know, what had God been doing in Paul's life in preparation uh, for this? And so, you know, I come to what I call Paul's qualifications, kind of his resume. And throughout his epistles, um, it, it, and throughout even the book of Acts, it kind of lays down some of these things. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 and 6, he talks about his ethnicity and his religious affiliation. He, he said that, you know, I'm an Israelite. Uh, I was from the tribe of Benjamin, a, a Hebrew of Hebrews. And, and he says that I was a, a Pharisee from the strictest sect of the Pharisees. So God had been working in his life preparing him to know and to understand the Old Testament scriptures, to be in that place that he was in. Uh, he talks about his education in uh, Acts chapter 22. He, he says that he studied under uh, Gamaliel. And so he was a, he was a, a teacher and, and, and he was leading and teaching Paul. So Paul was being educated. He was learning. God was working that out in his life. And he talked about his nationality uh, in Acts 22 also. He said that he was a Roman citizen. And so you think, well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, if you were a Roman citizen during Paul's time, that meant freedom of access, freedom of travel. He could travel where he wanted to. He had certain perks and certain protections that, uh, that the average Jewish person or somebody else might not have. As a Roman citizen, uh, he had certain rights and abilities to travel. So you can see God working in his life, kind of preparing him uh, for this ministry that he had been called. You know, Paul was kind of living what I called the, the Hebrew dream. I mean, he was on a track. Before he was Paul, he was Saul. And he was on this track, you know, this ladder climbing of, the, of a rabbinic uh, lifestyle. And so he is just growing in what he's doing. And God's preparing him in that for what he's got for him to do. Well, the Apostle Paul also had some things going against him. And I call that his disqualifications or, or really some hindrances in his life that that would keep him from being part of this call of God on his life to, to go and preach to the Gentiles. And the first is he hated the church. He hated the Gentiles. You know, Paul wasn't just, you know, didn't mind them, didn't have anything to do with them. He, he hated them. He hated the church. He was actively, in fact, in Galatians 1, 13, he was actively and violently persecuting the church. I mean, he was seeking to destroy the church, to stop it cold. I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of a disqualification, wouldn't you think, to, to, you know, for God to position you to be the, the, the person to take the gospel to the Gentiles, the one who's trying to destroy the church. It just seems like he wouldn't be the obvious guy for that choice. Uh, in fact, he was present and approved of the stoning of the first martyr, Stephen. I mean, he, he was really uh, actively trying to destroy the church. Uh, his, his religious beliefs and his, his position as a Pharisee was a hard thing for him to overcome. You know, he was in a pursuit of, of political and educational and, and social status that would disqualify him. He wasn't looking to be one of the way, uh, as, as he calls them, you know, the church. He was, he was on a different career path altogether. He had a certain social status as a Pharisee. Um, you think about his career. You think about his comfort. Uh, he, he lived a very comfortable life. Uh, as, a, as a religious leader in Israel and as a Pharisee. He, he, he had uh, financial wealth he, he was taken care of. He was looked up to. Uh, he was accepted by his peers and looked up to, the, to by those around him. Uh, uh, you know, all of the cultural norms that, that we look at for a, a comfortable, you know, life, 
Paul had all of those things, and so those things would seem to be a detriment to him being called to take the gospel to the Gentiles. In fact, the Apostle Paul saw himself as the most unlikely and undeserving person that God could choose to fulfill this purpose and plan of, of taking the, the gospel to the Gentiles. Now you see that uh, in verse 8. If you look at verse 8, he says, To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles. And so Paul looked at himself and he said, Man, I am the very least of them. And he, he had that mindset because in 1 Corinthians, he said that he was the least of the apostles because he had persecuted the church of God. He recognized that, man, I've got this going against me. I'm the least unlikely person to be taking the gospel to the Gentiles. Well, although he had all of these things that were, we would look at and say, you know, that guy is not the guy. If you were to look at Paul before God got a hold of him, you would think, that guy will never be the one, you know. He'll never be a Christian. He'll never be the one taking the gospel to somebody else. And so you can see that. But God had a different plan for his life. Part of God's eternal purpose in his life were all of these things. These things that seem like a detriment to doing the will of God actually becomes part of the will of God in his life to prepare him for that. And that's part of his testimony. If we were to go back to to Acts chapter 9, uh, Paul's testimony is this. He was out persecuting the church. He was on his way to Damascus to imprison and persecute the, the believers there. And he had a set purpose. He was going to destroy this new movement, this new religious movement that he saw as something opposed to the, the true religion as he saw it. And so he was on his way there. And, and God just knocked him off his high horse. I mean, just put him to the ground, blinded him. Uh, just got his attention in such a way that Paul couldn't deny it. I mean, he just, he had to recognize that, you know, this is God and he's calling me. I mean, he, you know, you can't have a, a conversion story like Paul's and, and just passively go on in your life. I mean, he was radically changed in that moment. And so you can see that he had his own purpose and plan but God's eternal purpose and plan is always bigger and better than what our purpose and plan is. And that purpose and plan for Paul included suffering. It included sacrifice, which brings us kind of to the next point, is Paul's sacrifice. And so, you know, you have to, I have to ask myself that question, you know, well, what did God's eternal purpose and plan for Paul's life, what did it mean for him? What was it going to cost him? And in fact, you know, God uh, made it clear to him from the very beginning that he was going to suffer. In that same uh, story in Acts chapter 9, where Paul is, is brought to a revelation of Christ, Christ appears to him on this road to Damascus, uh, Paul also appears to one of the believers, one of the disciples uh, in Damascus, a guy named Ananias, and he tells him, I want, you to, I want you to go to this Paul guy. Now, you got to understand, Ananias had some rejection of that because you know, this is the guy who's persecuting the church. And you want me to go to him? And God tells him, says, go, for I have, a, he's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles. He tells Ananias, I want you to get up and I want you to go to Paul and I want you to give him this message. And this is part of the message. He says, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So from the very beginning, Paul knew that he was going to have to suffer for Jesus. He knew that turning from this way that he was on of being the one that was persecuting the church, now he was going to be one of the ones that were being persecuted because he, he knew that he would lose everything that he had. Think about that. Um, when, he, when he became a Christian, when he turned away from his way of life, from, from the Jewish way of life, uh, and, and following Jesus, he lost everything. He lost his social status. He lost all of his friends. He, he lost his, probably his family. Everything that was comforting and, and, and comfortable for him, he lost. And he knew that up front. And yet he still chose uh, to, to, to walk in that. And so you see that God's eternal purpose and plan included this suffering uh, for Paul. And, and, and so... Thinking about Paul's life in this way, that, that he realized that he had been called by God, 
and that he had certain things God had been working in his life, preparing him for this mission, for this journey he was going to be on of, be on of taking the gospel to the Gentiles. And, and, and even despite all of the things in his life that would be a disqualification or a hindrance to him, you see his testimony and you see what God did in his life to get his attention. So that brings me to the thought of what's our application for this? How does, that's Paul, that's his life, that's what he went through, but, but Paul was special. You know, he, he's just a different guy. Well, what's that got to do with me? Well, to be honest with you, it has everything to do with us because God's call on Paul's life is no different than the call on our lives. And so that's going to be our application uh, this morning. And in fact, I'm going to kind of, I don't know if I'd call it, break it into two parts. But uh, here this morning, um, we fall into one or two, one of two categories, broad categories, as people sitting here uh, this morning hearing this message. Um, either you have not yet put your faith in Jesus uh, as your Lord and Savior, or you have already put your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And so, so I'm going to talk about this from those two perspectives, from the perspective of those who have not yet trusted in Christ and those who have already trusted in Christ. Because the, the message is, the application is somewhat similar, but, but different in that. And so I'm going to start where we just left off with Paul, with, with the suffering issue, with the sacrifice issue. You know, if you have not yet uh, trusted Christ as your Savior, despite what you may have heard, I think it's only fair to warn you that, that taking part in God's eternal purposes and plans um, having a relationship with Jesus, walking with Jesus, um, uh, does, doesn't come without sacrifice and suffering. It, it just doesn't. I mean, that's a reality. Maybe you've heard people tell you, well, if you, if you accept Jesus as your Savior, everything will be okay, everything will work out okay, everything will be fine, you'll never have it. You'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise, and, and that's not what the Scripture says. Uh, Jesus warned that, that if you follow me, you're going to face persecution. You're going to have to suffer uh, for my name. Now, now, understand that our suffering, our sacrifice, is not what gains us salvation. It's not what we are doing uh, to, to be saved. In fact, Jesus has made the only sacrifice uh, that's necessary for our salvation. So he's done that. But as you walk with God it's going to require that there be sacrifice, that, that you suffer. In fact, in Luke chapter 14, Jesus tells us that we can't even be his disciples unless we're prepared to give up everything, to lay everything aside, lay all of our, our relationships, put those on the back burner compared to our relationship with Jesus, that we have to be prepared to bear our own cross. And, and in our mind, that's I think it carries some different weight than what it probably did for the first century uh, Jewish person or, or, or Gentile. Bearing your cross was, was not some nice little cross hanging on the wall. It was, it was a disgraceful way to die and suffer. It was, it, was, it was brutal. It was terrible. And so when he spoke of you're going to have to bear your own cross, he was talking about suffering and possibly dying uh, for the sake of his name. And so, you know, that's, that's, we have to be prepared for that. In fact, in Philippians chapter 1, Paul writing says, For it's been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. So coming into a relationship with Jesus um, is going to cost you. I'll just be honest with you up front. If, if you've not yet trusted Christ with your Savior, I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say, well, everything will be just fine. Everything, you know, it will all work out in the end, but, but that doesn't mean that your life is without problems, that, that now all of a sudden you never suffer from sickness and, and you never uh, go without, you never lack the finances or any of those things. In fact, you're going, it's going to cost you a lot. It'll probably cost you some relationships. In fact, I, I would almost guarantee you that if you start walking with Jesus, 
you're going to have friends and relatives that are going to walk away from you. They're not going to want anything to do with you. And on top of that, you're going to find yourself, your lifestyle incompatible with some of the people that you normally hang out with. And you're just going to say, it's not that I dislike them or they dislike me or, or they've told me to go away, but there's just not a compatibility. I can't live that lifestyle anymore. So you, it's going to cost you some of your relationships. It may cost you your job. You know, you may work for a company or, or work in a business now that requires you to do things that are immoral or illegal or just plain out wrong, and it might cost you your job. You may have to walk away from that job, or you might get fired because you, now you won't do that illegal thing that your boss wants you to do or that immoral thing. So it could cost you your job. Uh, it, it'll cost you your entertainment. Uh, the things that entertain you uh, now uh, aren't going to be the same. Uh, those things you'll find uh, aren't so entertaining anymore, and so it'll cost you your entertainment. It's going to cost you your, your plans for the future because now you're not making all of the plans for your future. Now you have to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to live for you? And so you may have, like Paul did, a career path set out in front of you and say, I'm going in this direction, and God say, no, you're not. You're going in this direction, and it may be in a total opposite direction from what you're in. I can tell you now, standing up here, I never thought in my wildest dreams that one day I would be standing in a pulpit and teaching from a pulpit, that I would be leading youth, that I would be taking on spiritual matters, uh, you know, uh, uh, helping uh, families to grow stronger. That was, I didn't have a career path actually, but that was definitely not part of it. It was never part of my plan for my life to do this. You know, when I surrendered to Jesus, Jesus says, I've got a track for you that I'm going to put you on, and it's nothing that you've ever thought about or considered in your life. And that's probably going to be so for just about everybody. Now, you may stay in the same job you're in, but your path for life is going to be different. You know something else it's going to cost you? It's going to cost you your sin. Um, that's just, you know, and we love our sin. We do. You know, there's a lot of sin that we live in that we just want to hang on to, and the thought of losing that is just not comfortable at all. But it's going to cost you your sin. You're going to be called to lay aside, to repent of that, to turn away from that sinful lifestyle, the things that brought you pleasure in the past, and follow a different path. It's going to cost you your sin. And you know what the greatest thing that it's going to cost you is? It's going to cost you yourself, okay? Your own self-will, your own self-desires. It's going to cost you yourself because God wants all of you. He doesn't want you just on Sunday morning sitting in a chair in a church somewhere. He wants all of you seven days a week, 24 hours a day. He wants your whole life. He doesn't want a little bit of it. You know, and I'll, I'll mention this a little bit later on, that for, for the Christian, there is no secular and sacred. Everything is sacred. So, so there is no Sunday morning Christianity. You're either walking with Jesus or you're not. And, and so he wants all of us. He wants our whole selves. So if you're going to follow Jesus, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you a lot. There's going to be sacrifice, and there's going to be uh, even suffering because... When people turn away from you, when you lose your job, when you go through the hard things that there are in life for walking with Jesus and following him, standing up for what he believes and what he says for you to believe, uh, it's going to cost you and it's going to hurt. So that's for you if you've not yet trusted Christ. Hopefully that was an encouragement to you. Uh, but you know what? The same thing is true for those who have already trusted Christ uh, as your Savior. And, and where you're at on this journey, on this path of walking with Jesus, on your spiritual journey, uh, we're all in different places. And, and God doesn't come in and take everything away from us all at once and do all of this. It would be awesome if he did. For some of us, our transformation, our salvation story is, is radical. Uh, for some, it's not. It was a slow, methodical move. But you know what? God is working in our hearts. He wants the same thing from us. He wants everything. He wants the, the whole you. He doesn't want you to just kind of live for him a little bit. He wants you to live for him totally. Uh, you know, and, and so I would ask you this question. You know, is your relationship with Jesus costing you anything? You know, are you having to sacrifice things for him? You know, some of the very same things I just described. Is that it? 
You know, does your relationship with Jesus cost you anything? If it's not, it should be. I mean, that, that, that's not my opinion. That's what the Word says, that if we follow Jesus, uh, we're going to suffer for that. We're going to have to sacrifice to follow Jesus. So something for you to think about. So then, you know, going backward another step, our testimony. Well, what about our testimony? Well, obviously, if you have not yet trusted Jesus as your Savior and Lord, you don't have a testimony of your salvation. But that doesn't mean that you don't have a testimony because you do still have a testimony that's part of God's eternal purpose and plan. And so I would ask you, what has God been doing in your life up to this point? Okay, so stop and think for a minute. Can you think of events in your life where there's no other logical explanation of what happened or what happened inside of your heart or, or something that happened around you that you, can, that you can pinpoint being anything but the hand of God? I don't think there's a person that if you really earnestly and honestly thought about it that you can say, man, you know, that, that's just unexplainable. How this happened, what, you know, how I ended up here, and you can see the hand of God in your life. I mean, consider the fact that you're here this morning. Why are you sitting in a church? If, you, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, why are you here this morning? What is it that's brought you here? I can tell you, it's the sovereign will of God that has moved in family members or, or some reason that's brought you here this morning. It's part of His eternal purpose and plan for your lives. In fact, in Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul was speaking uh, at the Areopagus, and he's speaking to the, the Athenians there, and he said that God has determined when and where each of us should live in order that we should seek Him and perhaps feel our way toward Him and find Him. So think about that. The reason that you live in Jacksonville, Florida in 2019 in December, and you're here in this, in this church sitting in that seat that you're in, is part of God's plan. It's part of His sovereign plan to lead you to Him, to draw you to Him. And so, you know, I mean, that's, that's, what, you know, that's what God is doing in your life. That's part of your, your testimony. Uh, you know, do you have a sense this morning that God is drawing your heart toward Him? I mean, I, I don't even know how to describe that. I, I remember when I was, uh, I got saved when I was about 10 years old, and it happened uh, at a, a tent revival, if anybody if you've ever been to a tent revival in a little town called Quincy, Florida. And it was a week-long revival, and I don't remember what day, but it was later on in the week when, when you know, God really got my attention. But leading up to that, I could just sense that God was doing something. I, I could sense that things weren't, the, uh, there was something stirring inside of me. You know, that's God. That's, that's the realization of God's will and its plan and its purpose for your life. So maybe you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. Maybe you've been in church a long time and you've just never made that decision. Do you sense God drawing and, and working in your life? That's part of your testimony. That's, that's how God is drawing you to Himself. So, and if you've already, uh, have already trusted Christ as your Savior, you know, I want you to take a moment right now to just think back on how God's purpose and plan for your life, how He worked that out in your life to lead you to Christ. What were the circumstances and the people in your life that, that you know, if, you were to tell, if, if I were to have you come up here and tell the story of how you came to accept Jesus as your Savior, you would think, oh, well, this was happening, and this person shared the gospel with me, and this happened, and that person... So what was that? Think about that for a moment. Just reflect back on that. Reflect back on your testimony of how you came to Christ as your Savior. Think about that moment when you realized your sinfulness and your need for salvation. I mean, that's part of our salvation testimony is that at some point in time we had to realize I'm a sinner and I'm separated from God and, and there's nothing I can do about it. And then how sweet it was to hear that Jesus had paid the penalty for my sin. I mean, just think about that moment for a second. That, that's your testimony. That's what Paul did. Paul said, hey, this is how God got a hold of me. I was on this path to go destroy the church in Damascus, and he knocked me down, he blinded me, and he did these things in my life to bring me to him. What's your story? You know, what's your salvation story? What is your testimony? Uh, the greatest thing you can do is to share that testimony with somebody. 
Not, not preach at them, but just share your story of how God got a hold of your life. And so that kind of leads into the idea of, of disqualifications or, or hindrances in your life. So if you've not yet trusted Jesus as your Savior, maybe you're beginning to think about how God's been working. Hopefully, you know, it, you're starting to think, well, God, how has God been working in my life? You know, maybe this over here in my life, God did that, and I've, somebody's talked to me about God over here, and you're starting to see some of that. And you may be thinking that, you know, you've got things that you've done or maybe things that you haven't done that somehow qualif disqualifies you from, from ever being a part of God's purpose that you think, man, you just don't know what I'm into. You just don't know the sin that's in my life. Uh, you don't know um, how far I've been away from, from the church, that, that I'm, I'm only here because uh, I'm forced to be here. I, I didn't want to be here this morning. Somebody made me come here this morning. And, and so you can look at yourself and think, man, I am just, what is there that would even qualify me to have God work in my life? Well, that thought line of thinking couldn't be more wrong. Um, uh, consider the Apostle Paul. Consider his life and what he had been doing. Consider how he had been so opposed to the church. Now, he thought he was doing God's will, but he was opposed uh, to Jesus. He didn't want anything to do with Jesus. And God reached out and got a hold of him. And in fact, consider what Paul is quoted as saying in 1 Timothy uh, 1.15. He says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the foremost, or some versions say I'm the chief of sinner, or some say I'm the worst sinner. Paul saw his life and his sinfulness, and he said, ah, you know, it's amazing that God ever even got a hold of me. And so, so that's, that's where you're at this morning. You know, maybe you're thinking, there's just no way. Uh, the sin I've committed or, or the religious ritual that I've failed to commit. Well, I have to tell you that there's no sin that you've committed there's no lack of, of religious thing that you can do that separates you from God, that disqualifies you from being part of his eternal purpose and plan. The only thing that you can do that would disqualify you is to reject what Jesus has already done. That's it. That is the only thing that stands between you and God is rejecting what he's already done. The sin, Jesus paid for all of our sins, all of them, every one, the very worst, He's paid for already. And so if you, if you have already trusted Christ as your Savior, you've already come to know that. You've already come to realize that, that God's eternal purpose and plan for your life included the forgiveness uh, of your sins, that that no longer hinders you. But you may be thinking there's other things in my life uh, that, that hinder me uh, from, from being really a part of, of God's plan. Uh, we, we, could, we could be thinking that, you know, maybe... You know, my personality uh, just, just hinders me, stops me from doing that. Maybe, maybe it's my education. I, I don't know enough about the Bible to really be a part of God's plan to share that uh, with someone else. Uh, maybe it's, it's my background. You don't know uh, what I used to be or, or what I've been connected with, and so nobody will ever, will ever look at me and, and listen to what I have to say. Uh, you might be thinking even of your abilities. You know, I, I could never stand up in front of people and, and, uh, and talk about God. Uh, I can tell you right now, my hands are ice cold. My mouth is dry. Uh, I'm sweating like a pig. Uh, it's just, you know, this is what happens. It's, 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 this, this, was not my, this was not my idea to one day, this was not my goal in life to stand up and, and preach. I'm thankful to God that he's called me to this but this is not what I thought I would be doing in my life. In fact, if, you, if you're thinking that way, you're in good company. Uh, Moses thought that way. I think, uh, just, so here are some of the things Moses kind of said to God uh, when God appeared to him in the desert, in the burning bush, right? Moses gave these excuses. You've got the wrong guy, okay? He says, you know, who am I to go back to Pharaoh and, and say these things? You know, who am I to represent you? you you've got the wrong guy. Uh, then he said, I don't even know you well enough. I don't even know your name, God. What is your name? Who am I going to tell them? Has, who am I going to tell the Israelites sent me? I don't even know you that well. You know, so, so if you're new to Christ, you might be thinking, I don't, you know, I haven't been walking with God that long. Who am I to, to, to go and preach the gospel to somebody? 
Right. It was Moses' excuse. And Moses said, they won't believe me. They won't listen to me. If I go back, they're not going to even hear me because, you know, I used to be part of Pharaoh's household. They're not going to listen to me, you know. Then he says, get, get this, he says, I don't have the abilities or the skills. I'm not, a, I'm not an eloquent speaker, you know. Uh, I've got issues. I can't, I can't stand up in front of people and talk. I can't stand in front of the Pharaoh and, and talk about these things. And then finally, now get this one. So this is, this is the desire thing. He basically said, I don't want to go. You know, can't you get somebody else to go? I just don't, yeah, I don't want to do this. I mean, have you ever, I mean, has that ever been in your mind? Lord, I don't, I just don't want to go and do this. Well, God has a way of changing uh, our desires. And so, a few years back, I was, went with Ray and Melissa, and we went to a crew conference uh, down in um, uh, a little place. I'm trying to remember what the name of, it was uh, Camp Gilead, right. We were at Camp Gilead, and there was a speaker from Cruz speaking, and I couldn't remember his name, and I asked Ray if he could remember his name. He couldn't remember his name. But what he said, one line of what he said sunk in. That's kind of shows you where I'm at. One thing this guy said in his whole message sunk in, and it stuck with me. He said, don't let the American dream rob you of your heavenly vision. Don't let the American dream rob you of your heavenly vision. You know, what's standing in the way of you hearing God and responding to his call in your life? Uh, for us, unfortunately, one of our, dis well, I don't know if I'd call it a disqualification, but one of our um, struggles, one of our hindrances is that we're Americans and we live in the most prosperous and forward-thinking country in the world. And, you know, it's just tough to give up all of those things and to step out and to step out of my comfort zone, to step out of my career path uh, to do what God wants me to do. And so my encouragement is don't let this American dream rob you of what this desire and these passions and these vision that God has given you uh, for your life. Don't let that become a hindrance uh, in your life. So moving from our disqualifications or our hindrances to our qualifications, well, if you have not yet trusted Christ as your Savior, you might be thinking, I don't have anything that qualifies me to take part in God's eternal purpose. Um, you know, I just can't think of anything that makes me qualified. Well, I would like to respectfully disagree with you and, and, and read a verse to you that's a very familiar verse. And... Let me read this verse to you and, and then see if you can see anything in this verse that tells you that you're qualified. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever, whoever believes in him should not perish and have eternal life. Are you sitting here this morning and you're a whoever? Okay, I think every one of you qualify for that. You're a whoever. Whoever believes in him is qualified. That, you know, that, that doesn't include just the religious type. The, the, you know, that includes all of us. Uh, that includes my type, your type. That includes the educated, the uneducated, uh, the, the Jew or the Gentile, uh, the religious or the irreligious, the rich or the poor. The whoever is all of us. Whoever believes in my name. So there's, there's nothing. That's your qualification right there. There's no other qualification needed but to be a whoever believes in him. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So, if you have already trusted Christ, then Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 is the verse that really jumps out to me. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole scripture. Ephesians 2 chapter 10 says this. Wait a minute. Yeah, 210. I'm on 310. I'm thinking that's not the verse. 210 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So think about that for a, a second. God has gone before you, and before even the creation of this world, he has prepared good works for you to walk in. He's been working in your life since before you were born. He formed you in your mother's womb with a plan and a design for your life. What more qualifications do you need? 
then the God of all creation has made you for his purpose and for his will to take place. That's, I mean, that's the greatest qualification of that there is, that, that God himself has set us apart, has called us to do his work. That's our qualifications. And so kind of ending up with our recognition of God's eternal purpose and plan uh, in the call on our lives as he did Paul. If you have not yet trusted Christ as your Savior, my prayer this morning is that now many of your objections and your questions about being, you know, participating in this eternal purpose and plan of God has, has been answered and, and you've begun to hear the sweet voice of Jesus calling to you. You know, in John chapter 10, uh, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Do you hear that? Does deep down inside of you something resonate and, and you sense that God is calling you to him? That's the, that's the voice, the still small voice of Jesus calling you to him. That's the call on your life to know him and to have a relationship with him and to begin this journey, this walk that's going to involve all of these things that I've talked about already, the struggles and the joys that there are in walking with Jesus. Do you hear his voice? Will you follow him, as it says? If you hear, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Will you follow Jesus? Will you, will you surrender your life and your plan for your life to his plan for your life? It's the greatest thing that there is. And if you've already trusted in Christ as your Savior, I have only one question for you. In fact, it's one that, that you know, two of my dear brothers here and Eastside, uh, Jim Boone and uh, Jay Mullally, I hear them say quite often, are you all in? If you've been around them very long, you've heard them say, are you all in? You know, not, you know, do you believe, do you like, you know, doing this Christian thing, but are you all in? Do you recognize the fact that God has called you to be a part and a participant in this eternal purpose and plan for this world? Not just, not just another drudgery day at the office, but he has a plan for your life. Now, now that doesn't mean that one day you're going to be standing up here in the pulpit and you're going to, you may mean that, uh, but that doesn't mean that you have to walk away from your, from your career, from your job, to go into the vocational ministry. The truth is, the ministry is wherever you're involved already, whether that's in school or whether that's uh, being a stay-at-home mom, or whether that's in the corporate world, whether you're an executive or a student, you know, that's your place of ministry. As I said before, there is no secular, sacred and secular for the Christian. I don't know if you thought about this. I've, I've probably said this to a couple of you, but I was talking to Martha the other day, and, and I was sharing this with her. Think about it. When Moses met, met God in the burning bush in the desert... God said, take off your shoes because where you're standing is holy ground. Why was that holy ground? He's out in the middle of the desert. Why? Because that's where the Spirit of God was. It was right there where he was standing. That was holy ground. Where's the Spirit of God at now? He's, he's in each believer. He's in each person who has trusted Christ as their Savior. So think of this. Everywhere you set your foot, everything you put your hand to becomes a holy thing whether that's mowing your grass, changing a diaper, doing physical therapy, preaching a sermon, everything you do as a believer in Jesus is a holy thing because the Holy Spirit goes with you everywhere you go. Everything you set your hand to. There is no, there is no secular for the Christian. There's only the sacred. Everything you touch now becomes a holy thing because of the Holy Spirit living within you. So do you recognize that, fault, that, that, that fact? Do, do you realize what that means for your life? That no longer when I go in to my job tomorrow morning, that this is, you know, I'm flipping burgers at you know, McDonald's or, or whatever that might be, however inconsequential it may seem, that what you're doing because you're there is a holy thing and you have a presence that the Holy Spirit goes out before you. And that God has prepared, prepared you in your abilities and your strengths. And, and he's given you spiritual gifts 
to take and to do His will, His purpose for your life. You're no different than the Apostle Paul or any of the other apostles. God has called you specifically for purposes for your life, whatever that might be. And so you can walk out in confidence knowing that God has gone before me and He's prepared these good works for me to do. The question is, is are you all in? Are you paying attention? Are you ready to be involved in God's will? Are you anxious about that? And, and I think that most of the time we're not because we're not aware of it. We go through our daily life and it just seems routine. Let that thought sink into your heart and your mind uh, as you go into whatever you do this afternoon, whether it's you're going out to eat at some restaurant, you sit down, whatever waitress you come in contact or waiter you come in contact with, here's a holy opportunity for you to have a witness to them, to, to show the love of Jesus. Everywhere you go, everything you do. One of the last things that Jesus is recorded as saying before he ascended into heaven was this. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Okay, so that's, that's, this is part of our calling in life, that everywhere we go, we're to bear witness to what God has done in our lives to others so that they can see that and so that they might come to know Jesus. Well, as I said in my opening statement, there are certain seasons and events in our lives which lend themselves to this personal reflection and life course correction. Sometimes our lives, we may be going one way and God is may be urging you this morning, I've been working in your life about this thing. I've been, you know, touching on your heart about this thing. I've wanted you to do, and you've kind of been resisting me. Whatever that might be. That might be trusting Him as Savior. That might be sharing your, your testimony with the person in the cubicle next to you, in the office that you work in. Whatever it is, you know, respond to that. And this upcoming New Year celebration is one of those opportunities for us to really reflect on our lives. Uh, uh, Martha was asking me, well, do you, you know, do you make a list? Do you, you know, sit down and reflect on your life for the past year? I can't even remember last week. I can't reflect on a past year gone by. All I know is God is doing something in my life, and, and He'll get my attention where that is. And so if you're like me, you know, some of you sit down and you make out a list of what, you know, what's been going on in my life and you review what my past year has been like. And I love those letters I get from families that, that talk about what they did over the past year, you know, what God's been doing in their lives. Yeah, that may be you, but reflect on that. Think about that. This is a great time for that. In fact, this morning, I wanted to make this morning an opportunity to do that. So when you came in, hopefully you were given a card, okay? Everybody get your card out. If you didn't, there are still some available. We'll it just, you know, come see me or Bonnie and we'll get you one of these cards. This is mine. This is the, you'll notice it has two sides. On one side it says the whatever pledge, okay? So this is my whatever pledge. I signed this June the 29th of 1999. We were at a Pioneers uh, Missions, like a banquet or something, I think, down wherever Pioneers is in Orlando. And they had handed these out, and, and it, it just simply reads, God has a loving plan of redemption for all the peoples of the earth, and he seeks to fulfill his plan through ordinary people like me. In light of this truth, I'm willing to do whatever he says for me to be involved in his plan, relinquishing my plan in favor of his. I will actively pray and ask him how he would have me be involved and then obey whatever he says. This has been hanging on my refrigerator in a couple of different residences since 1999. And over the course of that time, God has drawn my attention to it and reminded me that on that date, I made a pledge to him that, Lord, I'll do whatever you call me to do, whatever that is. Now, you may or may not feel like signing and dating that card this morning, but if you think about it, it, it's nothing more than a piece of paper. It, it's nothing special or holy. But if you think about the Israelites, when they would do something, when God would show up and do something in their life, you know, like crossing the Red Sea, they would set up a pile of stones or something. They would set up this little altar. And, and that altar became a place of remembrance for them, where, where when they saw that or their children saw that, and said, well, what is this? Their mind would be brought back to that moment in time when, when God had done something in their life or when they had made a commitment in their life. That's the, 
That's the purpose of, of the whatever pledge card, is, is if, you, you know, if you feel like you can earnestly and honestly say this to God, sign your name to it and put today's date on there. Or take it home with you and pray about it and let God work on you until you give in and sign it and write a date on it. And, it, it, and, and hang it somewhere. Th this recently is part of the reason why I'm here in this church serving as a youth pastor. Some of you know this, and some of you may not know this, that if you would have asked me a year ago if I would be doing this, I'd told you no. I would never go back into the full-time ministry again in my life. I had no plans. But God has a plan, and God began to work on me. He began to work in my heart. And I remember I walked up, and this has been on my refrigerator in the same place for years. We've been in the house we're in now, I don't know, 15 I don't know how long we've been there. It's been hanging on that refrigerator in the same place, and I go up to the refrigerator quite often, and this thing sits there, and it didn't catch my attention. And I remember one day after having conversations with some folks about, well, why, you know, why aren't you entertaining this thought of, of you know, being the youth pastor and family pastor and me and my mind saying, no, nah, I'm never going to go back into the ministry again. Walking up to that refrigerator, and this thing like jumped off the refrigerator at me, just stared me in the face. And I had to say, God, I remember. Yes, thank you. I remember saying to you that I'll do whatever you want me to do. And if you want me to do this, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And so that's the purpose of this card. On the back side of that card is another, is another little thing, and it's the yes, I do. And I'm not going to call it a pledge. It's just a yes, I do. If you're here this morning... And, and you've sensed God working in your heart, drawing you to Him, preparing you, working in your heart, saying, yes, God, I surrender to you. I want to know you as my Lord and Savior, and you've made that commitment to Him. There's an opportunity for you to sign that. It just, it just lays out some of the basic ideas of, of what it means to come to faith in Jesus. Yes, I do acknowledge my sin and my need for forgiveness. Coming to Christ as Savior means you need to know, you need to recognize that you have a need that you cannot fulfill, that you can never be good enough to deserve God's forgiveness. But you recognize that. The second thing is I repent of my sin. I turn and go in the different direction. I'm going this way away from you, God. I'm going to turn and I'm going to turn towards you. And I'm going to seek your face and I'm going to seek your forgiveness. The third thing is, is Yes, I do believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sin and that he was buried and rose from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures. That, that you believe what you've heard, that Jesus has paid the penalty for your sin. And, and that when they nailed him to that cross, he died and he took, he paid the death penalty that was required for sin. And they buried him and that three days later he arose from the dead and he lives today. And, and, and you believe that and you know that for a fact. And finally, yes, I do place my faith in and receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, that, that you accept his payment for sin for yourself. And if you can, and if you can earnestly do that, uh, then I would suggest that you sign your name to it and, and date that for today. Because one day, you're going to have, very soon probably, if you've made that decision for Jesus, you're going to have doubts. You're going to wonder, is this thing real or not? Or was this just some just emotional thing I went through? And you're going to look at this and you're going to say, yeah, it's going to bring back that memory. And it's going to say, yeah, I remember when I committed my life to Jesus and he came in and he saved me. And it's going to be a blessing for you someday. I wish I had, I wish I had a little card from when I got saved. I don't remember dates and times. That they don't stick in my mind. I remember the moment uh, of, of my salvation, but I wish I knew the date and the day of it. So that's, that's the purpose of, of the little car. So in conclusion... This is on your, layout, on your uh, handout. As we take the time to reflect on the past and look to and plan for the new year before us, let's do so not by making well-meaning but fruitless New Year's resolutions, but instead with the help and through the power of the Holy Spirit, let us give ourselves wholly to the eternal purpose and plan of God. Let me pray for us. Father God, it is a real comfort and relief to me to know that you have a plan that uh, in my wildest dreams and my best plans for my life are nothing compared to yours and to think that you would 
call me, to call us to be a part of your plan and a part of your plan for reaching the world with the good news of your salvation and leading others to know you as Lord and Savior and changing their eternal destination, that you choose to use us in that. Lord, how amazing that is. And so this morning, uh, Lord, whether uh, the folks here, whether they fall into that category of have not yet trusted you, would you work in their heart to draw them to yourself? As I've been praying for the past two weeks, Lord, would you do a work in somebody's life this morning uh, to uh, show yourself to them in such a way that like the Apostle Paul, they wouldn't be able to do anything uh, but surrender uh, to your will for their life, that they would know you as Lord and Savior today. And Lord, would you give them the boldness uh, to uh, share that uh, with us so that we might celebrate their new life with them. And Father, uh, for the rest of us who, who have already trusted you as Lord and Savior, that you would uh, let it be so in our life, that, that it wouldn't just be a hollow pledge, but that it would be uh, real, uh, that we would surrender all of our lives to you, that we would be all in, that we would be all in uh, with, with uh, our minds, uh, all in with our hearts, uh, Lord, all in with our finances, with, with our jobs, with our families, with, with wherever we are right now, uh, Lord, that we would be all in for you, that we would be set apart and we would recognize and live for your will and your purpose on this earth. And so, Lord, I know that's what you're about. I know that there is nothing uh, that can thwart your purposes and plans. And so we can uh, walk in confidence in that. And so, again, I just thank you for this morning. And thank you uh, for the work in my life and the work in the lives of my brothers and sisters here. And I give you all the praise and all the glory, Jesus. And it's in your name that I pray these things. Amen.